Most textiles will have some sort of dye added to it to impart a color or a vibrancy to the textile. And yes, some of these textile dyes might be responsible for triggering different types of skin rashes. It's technically not considered common for textiles to trigger rashes in the skin, but I do suspect a lot of these numbers are underreported because if you think about how a textile dye reaction would be diagnosed, there aren't a lot of great tools to actually get us to that diagnosis. As a dermatologist and as someone who trains other medical students, residents, as well as other healthcare professionals and understanding key diagnostic criteria and diagnoses in dermatology, what I've really learned is that if you don't even know the diagnosis exists, you're not going to be able to make the diagnosis. Unless you're really well versed on understanding the different sources of reactions in the skin as a result of contact between your skin and the environment, you may not even factor textile dye dermatitis into your differential diagnosis. So what kinds of textile dyes are there? There's there are a little over a dozen different types of dyes used in textiles. Unfortunately, we do not have the privilege of an ingredient label on our clothing items to actually tell us which dyes were used in the process of making any clothing items that you might get. And quite frankly, I'm sure that many brands don't even know this information because when you source textiles, when you actually produce garments for your brand or your line, you source the textile that might design it into the garment of your choice. However, where those fabrics come from, how they were created, may be reliant more in a different industry, that those details aren't always disclosed. You can't even really hold brands accountable for what might be used as dyes in their fabrics, only because a lot of this is based on the supply chain and where those fabrics are sourced from. You can't always reliably know all of the details of what the textile went through before it made it to your hands to actually produce it or design it into whatever kind of garment you choose to make. So when you think of textile dyes, really pretty much most textiles are dyed in some capacity. Even if you think of like a white cotton t-shirt, your traditional stark white cotton t-shirt, even that's probably dyed white because the natural hue of cotton is actually not white. It's more of an oatmeal type of look and has multiple hues throughout it of various textural elements. Ultimately, there's more likely than not going to be some element of dyeing in any textile that you come into contact with, whether it be clothing items, upholstery for furniture, bedding, linens, all of these textiles could have some element of textile dyes that could interact between your skin and the garment. All of these places are where textile dyes may have been used and their interaction between your skin is where we always have to suspect the possibility of a reaction occurring. Basically anything that interacts with your textiles that imparts a color or a hue to it and leaving that behind is dyeing the fabric. There are different types of textile dyes available simply because some are better at attaching to natural fibers like like cotton, silk, and wool, whereas others might be better adapted to attaching to synthetics such as polyester and nylon, and others need larger molecule bases to attach to. Now there are lots of different dyes out there, and certain ones are more associated with skin rashes than others. Now most dyes are designed to attach to cotton or other natural fibers. These would include things like sulfur dyes, which are really commonly used, azoic dyes, fiber reactive dyes, that dyes, direct dyes, natural dyes, and all-purpose dyes. The ones that are most often used for synthetics like polyester and nylon, for example, would be things like solvent dyes and dispersed dyes. There are two other categories of dyes called acidic dyes and basic dyes based on how they attach to the fiber or the fabric, with basic dyes intended more for things like silk, acrylic or polyester, not really for cotton, and acidic dyes being intended more for wool, silk, and nylon, not really for cotton or polyester. Now out of the dye classes, the ones that are most commonly associated with allergic contact dermatitis would be the dispersed dyes. Now there are case reports and even cases of hyperpigmentation from other types of textile dyes, including ones in the categories for VAT or VAT dyes, acid dyes, and direct dyes. You always have to bear in mind that our standardized patch testing that we offer in dermatology practices doesn't really include this whole slew of textile dyes. And standardized patch testing in this country include Disperse Blue 106 as well as Paraphenylene Diamine. Both of these are in the Disperse dye category, which means they're primarily associated with polyester types of fabrics. 
it's really hard to state with certainty what the actual incidence of textile dye dermatitis is simply because again it's really underreported it's hard to say unless testing is actually performed to confirm the diagnosis so many people are left to either assume it was one item or another or rely on just suspicion clinical suspicion if they even have it Many times when people come into doctor's offices, especially before they've even come to their dermatologist, most people are suspecting their laundry detergent, which as we've discussed before, is so rarely associated with these types of contact dermatitis cases that we rarely find that most people just go out and change their laundry detergent or just stop wearing certain types of clothing items. So we don't really know what items set off their chain of events unless we test them further to figure out what the true trigger is. That usually that's only done if their rashes become persistent or reluctant to leave. In the review papers I've come across when it comes to contact dermatitis to textile dyes, I've seen ranges of incidences from under 1% to even up above 30%. With most studies showing it's probably around the 4 to 5% range, but again, this is really difficult to estimate with certainty with the underdiagnosis of this type of reaction out there. So the real challenge is that there is no simple way to test for a textile dye reaction. So we really are often left to just some detective work where we have to work together as physician and patient to figure out what is happening. I find that most cases of textile dye dermatitis that I make in practice are based on working really closely with my patients to figure out a true timeline and almost detective wise to say, well, what is the actual clinical history of the rash that you're experiencing? What are the patterns of distribution of the rash that you have? And then sometimes we have to integrate things like skin biopsies or allergy testing to really try to pinpoint if there's a true trigger or if we have some things on our patch testing that commonly co-react with other types of dyes out there to help us hone in our diagnosis a little bit better, or at the very least exclude other diagnostic possibilities. For example, one study I came across from Sweden showed that the most common distribution of contact dermatitis from textile dyes to, to be along the neck, under the arms, the arms themselves, the face, and even often the hands for women in this particular study. So think about why this might have been, why that distribution was there, and then think about why a textile dye would even interact with your skin. For textiles to truly trigger a rash in your skin as a result of the dyes, oftentimes the textile has to be wet with sweat or moisture, which is often a trigger to release the dye from the fabric and actually get onto your skin to trigger a reaction with your skin. So naturally the areas that moisture tends to really accumulate during the course of the day or through activity would be along the neck, under the arms, the groin, and along the feet and hands. It could even happen along the face if there's some point of contact between the textile and your skin, say example for pillowcases and hats and other types of scarves or garments that might come into direct contact with the skin there. There was a large review of textile contact dermatitis that showed that various case reports that show that pantyhose, undergarments, and socks as sources for this type of contact dermatitis. This also implies that sweat plus friction can also be triggers. Another big challenge that comes up when diagnosing contact dermatitis to textile dyes is it might not actually be the dye itself. There might be an intermediate that's produced during the process of applying the dye to the textile. This came up in a case report I came across for VAT dyes or VAT dyes, where there was a byproduct during the process of textile dyeing that was produced that triggered a particular patient's contact dermatitis. And again, this is very difficult to test for unless we really are suspecting a trigger to be there. So as with all of the information we provide, the real question is what do you do with this information? Where do you go from here and how do you take this information and apply it to your day-to-day -day life? So remember, first off, that allergies to textile dyes are not considered common, but are considered possible. I wish it was as simple as saying to just choose a particular type of fiber like cotton or polyester to avoid this type of reaction, but we really can't say that simply because different types of dyes that are usually associated with different types of fibers have been associated with this type of reaction. Yes, dispersed dyes associated with polyester are more commonly associated with it, but that does not exclude the possibility of other dyes that are more commonly associated with cotton fabrics to also elicit reactions in the skin. So much of this is based on the color fastness, how much that color stays attached to the textile, the environment that the textile is in relative to your skin with regards to sweat and friction, 
and quite frankly, the integrity of your skin. If it's a thinner skinned area, like under the arms and the neck relative to the back, for example, those areas are gonna be more prone to contact dermatitis from these textile dyes. As we get older, our skin naturally thins as well, which might make us more susceptible to these reactions, as well as the integrity of our skin from the perspective of, are you already dealing with some baseline level of inflammation that this type of reaction could make worse? I wish it was as simple as just saying to choose white clothing or black clothing, but unfortunately most clothing items, even if they're white or black, have some dye associated with them because again, these are not natural colors that are being imparted in the fabrics. You could try to choose undyed fabrics. It's hard to come across that. If you're looking for vibrancy in your clothing colors, that's not a bad thing, but you just wanna factor in, for example, how you're gonna approach your process. Always remember that your contact with textiles and dyes is not limited to clothing items. It can also be occurring with the upholstery items in terms of furniture items that you're coming into contact with. So once you verify that you've got a contact dermatitis, next step is you need to figure out your time of onset. When do you really remember this starting? Where was the location of your rash? Where on your skin did you first start to notice symptoms? Think about the potential role that clothing could have played. Were you wearing a new garment? Was there a lot of friction or sweating in that garment? Was it something that you that you don't traditionally wear or a brand that you don't traditionally purchase from? Think about the upholstery, the bed sheets and towels as well in that same conversation. Think about the interaction between your skin and those textiles with regards to sweat and friction. Patch testing for common allergens can be performed in the office, but remember this, this is not a full list of possible common contact reactions. This test is really limited by the series that we have available to us in routine practice. So you may not get a full picture, but it might give you some clues as to where to hone in your efforts. For example, at le the very least on the patch test panels that we routinely use, they do have many of the ingredients that are found in traditional detergents, for example. So at the very least, you could exclude some other potential triggers as you're trying to seek the true cause for your actual rash. Remember that if you've tried a new brand of clothing or type of fabric, it might be worthy of trying out different types of textiles and different types of colors along the way just to see if there's a difference. This is not a brand specific issue because it's really not that brands are going out there necessarily and choosing textiles that could be much more problematic. So much of this is based on sourcing and things that they may not have full access to in terms of data or information when they're choosing textiles. I found it very challenging when I'm choosing textiles for my own brand to figure out what types of dyes and how it's performed simply because this information is not readily available and very challenging to get your hands on. If there is a particular clothing item that you're suspecting, say something that you have to wear as a uniform for a sports team or for work, consider the role that layering can play. Meaning you can layer clothing underneath your, your uniform so that you can actually provide your skin with an added layer of protection from the textile to reduce your interaction between your skin and that textile directly. And also consider the role that laundering the garment could play in terms of reducing the load of textile dye that could be released from it onto your skin. But in terms of laundering the item, it's hard to say how effective that is in terms of reducing the textile dye load. It should to some extent because so much of this is based on color fastness. And you are able to rinse out the garment to get some of that textile dye out of it that could be readily released on your skin it may help, but that might also impact how vibrant the hue or the color is and lead to fading a lot faster. So consider the role that that clothing item plays in your day-to-day -day routine and whether or not you can get away with aging the garment a little bit faster.